Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. It's good to be together. We are going to come back into worship here uh, after my message. We really just want, uh, we really wanted to start creating more room for the Holy Spirit to work and move on our hearts. As Dorothy said, um, you know, we're really not a big fan of like going through church motions. Um, like when we come in and we have a liturgical set of things that we do and then we leave. We truly believe that in this room, God has work to do on our hearts and on our minds to help us individually, to grow, and as well as to empower us to go out and make disciples. And so one of our heartbeats here is that we slow down long enough in worship and in our service to let God have room to work by his spirit in our hearts. Because here's the reality, um, I personally can't preach 1,400 different messages or 1,500 different messages to 14, 1,500 different people every week. But the Holy Spirit can nurture and heal and work even during worship and even during my sermon in different ways. In fact, I may read a scripture today and God opens your eyes to something I haven't seen yet because he's wanting you to get in his word and to teach you something. And so I'm praying even that happens today. And I'm praying that we won't count God out, or I'm sorry, ourselves out of the sermon today. If it doesn't seem like like it may be a topic that is for you, I need you to understand that God can work through every scripture I share to speak to you or to use, for you to use for others this week that you're gonna encounter. I mean, how many times have you read the Bible and go, man, I I didn't really get anything from that this day. But then when you're out in public and someone is sharing something or you're out with your friends or, or family or coworkers and all of a sudden the scripture comes to, to your remembrance once you read that day because it wasn't for you, it was for someone else. And so this is the attitude and the, and the mindset that we have here at Calvary as well as what the Holy Spirit wants to do. So we're on our series, Church According to Jesus, and we're on our next step of making disciples. And this is such an important step. And we've covered reach, connect, grow, and today I wanna cover empower. And empower in a nutshell means this, to, to practice and to be, and to, have, to practice and to have the power of the Holy Spirit to make disciples. I've been empowered through my examples in my life by people training and teaching me how to make disciples. But God doesn't just stop there. He gives you the power of himself, the power of the Holy Spirit to help you do just that. So while we have practical training that we can do to empower us and equip us, another good word for this step is equip, we also have the Holy Spirit to equip us. There was a purpose behind the growth of the disciples. When Jesus reached them and then he got them connected and then he helped them grow, There was a purpose behind that growth, and it was to equip them and empower them to make disciples. There is a purpose to your spiritual growth because you have a purpose in the kingdom of God. God saves us from the grip of sin. That's the reach. He includes us into his family. That's the connect. And he raises us up in his ways. That's the grow. And then he equips or empowers us to go, which is next week, and make disciples. And Rick Warren once said, God changes caterpillars into butterflies, sand into pearls, and coal into diamonds using what? Time and process. It was through the time and process that the disciples were with Jesus that they went from from just caterpillars into butterflies, so to say, sand into pearls, and coal into diamonds. And, And Peter himself even had to go through a difficult trial of even denying Jesus, betraying Jesus, but then Jesus reinstates him back into ministry. So he went the wrong way, and then Jesus comes and says, do you love me three times? And he's like, yes, I do. And he said, then feed my sheep. In other words, begin to be the shepherd of the church and pastor and lead the church. So sometimes we go through difficult things to be empowered as well. This empower focus is important because, well, 
we can get stuck at the third step in discipleship or the third culture of discipleship, and that's grow. We can just grow, 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 and we get so deep and so deep in our knowledge and understanding of God. And I'm going to give you a visual real quick to help, under, to help us understand it. Imagine physically that you go deeper with God, so you dig in a hole, and you're digging down, and you're digging down, and next thing you know it, the, hole, the top of the hole is way up there. And so you've gotten all this biblical knowledge, and you've gotten all this spiritual growth for yourself, and you're going deeper, right? Like, let's go deeper with God. But the problem is all the lost people are at the top of the hole. And they don't know anything that you know because all they need to know right now is if someone loves them or not. What they need to know is who is this Jesus person. And those are two very basic teachings of the Bible that, that we kind of, we get to and we learn, but then we want to go deeper and deeper. And, we'll, and, we'll, and I just want to be honest with us, church. Is that okay? Can I be honest today? I should always be honest, right? <laughs> Do I have to have permission to be honest? No. We can't just keep coming to church or Bible studies and just keeping it to ourselves. You know, we really can't. The purpose for today for us as disciples is that we'll take what we get and use it. Use it. It's fresh bread to feed others. And what happens is if we keep it in our cupboards too long, what happens to it? It gets stale. There's a reason why we read our word every day because every day we come in contact with the lost. Every day we come in contact with a brother or sister of Christ who needs more of Jesus and needs help. So we become too focused on growing and growing, but we don't put all that we know and have learned into an experience or practice of making disciples. To empower someone is to expect that they have a purpose in God's kingdom. Isn't that cool? Your purpose isn't just to learn and grow a bunch. Your purpose is to do something for God. That's awesome. This step is nudging yourself or the person that you're discipling to go from growing to serving and doing. I recently told a friend, uh, he's, man, he, is, he knows the word. And he has a heart to help people grow. And I told him, I had this visual of him that he's on his bed, he's got his socks on, he's got his clothes on, but he's missing one important thing. What do you think that is? Shoes. It's like you know that you're ready. You have everything on, but before you go out that door, you need one more thing, and that's your shoes. And it's time to get to work, church. I mean, it's time to get to work. I mean, we have been learning and growing for years, many of us. And maybe it's just a lack of confidence or belief that I can do anything in God's kingdom when you can. And it's time to put on our shoes and get to work. To go to the next step, which is go and make disciples. I'm praying by the end of this message today, you feel the confidence because you'll hear that you have a lot of help in your corner. Personally, I've had to fail forward. I don't like failing. It's, it's a fear of mine. Because if I fail, then that makes me feel like I'm a failure. But I'd rather fail forward. I'd rather try and have not succeeded than never try. In fact, I grew in my confidence of making disciples as I began to help one person at a time just follow Jesus, answer one question. Hey, where do you find the book of Ephesians? Well, let me help you with that. Do you know what it means? Let me explain what, what Ephesians is all about. Just stuff like that. And by the way, we're never ready. We're never perfectly ready to make disciples. I'm still learning. You're still learning, right? Yes. But it's like we have that fresh bread. We got a bunch of loaves of bread in our cupboard, in our pantry, and we're, we need to give it out, and we need to give Jesus out but we have God to empower us to help us along the way. And I have to put this out there. God put this on my heart this morning. We are not weak. We are strong. God does not make weak disciples or weak followers. He makes strong, empowered followers. So today I want to increase our faith and confidence today by going through multiple scriptures 
of how God empowers us. So if you want to go to Matthew 28, and it's actually going to be 18 through 20. It would be on the screen as well, I believe, starting with verse 19. But verse 18 says this, and it's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This has been an anchor text for us, this entire series. We need to understand that we've actually been commissioned by the authority of Jesus to make disciples in all the world. And so I want to get really simple and practical real quick. You ready? Here we go. You can make disciples simply because Jesus wants you to. Wow, I had to go to college and get a degree to say that. (laughs) We can simply make disciples. We have the power to do so because Jesus, with all his authority, said, go and make disciples. If Jesus wants you to do something, I guarantee you, if you start doing it, you will succeed. I guarantee you. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I like that. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This was a command and a plan from God, and God wouldn't ask us without equipping us. God would not ask you to do anything if he wasn't going to equip you for the task. John 14, 12 through 14, it'll be on the screen for you. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. And even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Wow. When Jesus goes to be with the Father, he is before the throne. He is interceding on our behalf, Hebrew says. But Jesus is representing us as we represent him on earth. So we literally have Jesus now helping us to do his mission and to do greater works, being the fact that there's more of us and we can do greater work. We can spread out more than what Jesus did. We're not better than Jesus. No one will ever be better than Jesus, but we can make a greater impact because we have Jesus before his Father working on our behalf to give us the power to do signs, wonders, and miracles and to preach the word boldly throughout this world. You have the help of Jesus. You have the help of God in that verse. And then he goes on to say this, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. It's not like, just so you know, he's not saying anything as in like a Chick-fil-A at the corner of my neighborhood. (laughs) It's a little deeper than that, right? It's a little less less self-motivated. You could do anything. You ask me for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, he says it again. He wants us to make sure we know. He says it again. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. To say in my name, the word name means character. So to do something in line with, consistent with the character of Christ, he will answer your prayer to have the same mindset and spirit and heart of Jesus. Whatever Jesus would ask, in other words, let's ask it. Whatever would bring glory to the Father, let's ask it. In other words, this context, this scripture, it has nothing to do with our daily needs so much as to say, as it has to do with the missional needs of being on mission for Jesus. He's talking to the disciples here And he's saying, when you get busy making disciples, you can ask for anything in my name. It's the context that's very important in the scripture. We can go to God with every need we have, every worry, every fear. We can bring our petitions before the Lord. We should. We should cast all our cares on the Lord, as the scripture says. We should do all that. But in this context, he's saying we must ask what's in line with the character and the mission of Jesus Christ, and God will do it. In other words, for me, one of my prayers 
is God, give me the words to say to my friend who is lost today, and he will do it. You see the context there? It's not Chick-fil-A at the corner of my neighborhood. That's self-motivated, and yes, that would be amazing. (laughs) But it's not necessary to make disciples, is it? Jesus did on-the-job training to empower and equip the disciples, but that was just the foundation for ministry experience. So Jesus gave the disciples a ministry experience. And so let's say you're helping the person that you've reached to get, to get connected and now to grow. We should do what Jesus did. We should bring the person that we're helping grow along with us as we serve in the church and outside the church in our community. In fact, one of the ways you can actually reach someone that's not even saved is to invite them to help you do ministry. Wouldn't that be cool? Hey, we're going to pack a bunch of Christmas boxes up for Operation Christmas Child. Would you mind helping out that week? I don't know if this person is listening, but there was an atheist that messaged me. Actually, this is a true story. He messaged me a couple weeks ago asking for an opportunity to volunteer here at Calvary. Um, I'm not sure if you're listening, buddy. But yes, you can. And I, and I message him back. And I'm looking forward to see what God does as he hangs out with me to serve. Amen. Right? Um, probably shouldn't bring that up because he probably is listening and watching. So we're doing that. But here's the thing. Yes, bring people in, empower them, equip them. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is the power that can do much more than we ever could through all of our practice and training. Like there's only so much training Jesus could do. And then he was like, I'm going to leave you with the Holy Spirit. So let's get into that. We are empowered to make disciples through the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Today, when we come back up here at the altars and we stay here for a moment, we're asking the Holy Spirit to come and fill us with power today. But you can also do this in your home. I was, I was filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit alone with God One time I was driving, that was kind of scary. I had to keep my eyes open on that one. Acts 1, 4 through 5. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days he will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In other words, to be submerged and filled and overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power. Not position, not a higher clout of Christianity. No, the Holy Spirit is power to do what? To be witnesses for God, not to be a bigger, bigger, more important leader in the church. It's a humbling power. It's a power that says you're meant to serve. You have a responsibility to give your life for the gospel, not to be on stage and be appreciated more because you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm putting, I'm exposing that because that's the teaching we keep finding is that, is that people feel like in order for them to, to feel more of a, a spiritual Christian, they must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, like, you're, like you elevate yourself to another level and it's not true. Ephesians 3.16, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, this is Paul praying for the church, he will empower you with the inner strength through his spirit. Church, The good news is, is that we are not alone. We have the help of Jesus through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Why do I say it like that? Because Jesus said, I will be with you until the very end of the age. How is that possible when he ascended up into heaven? How is that possible? It's possible through his spirit. When you read the Holy Spirit, it's been interpreted as in the Greek, that it's just like Jesus is standing or with you, right next to you or in you. Holy Spirit and Jesus are equivalent. It, they, it's Jesus' presence with you through the Holy Spirit. So he didn't lie to the disciples. He kept his word. He said, I will be with you to the very end of the age. And he was with them through the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15 through 17. If you love me, obey my commands. 
and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. John 14, 26. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. John 16, 5 through 15, but now I am going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. By the way, our job is not to convict people, is it? Our job is to preach the truth, preach the word, love, and the Holy Spirit does the convicting. Amen. Verse 12, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. How many times have we read that? That's like three or four times now. He will guide us into all truth. He would not speak on his own, but would tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That it, this is why I said the Spirit would tell you whatever he receives from me. If we run through that really fast, we're going to miss something really important. The entire Trinity is on your side to help you. We just read Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The entire Trinity is in your corner. The Father speaks to Jesus. Jesus speaks for the Father. And then the Holy Spirit speaks for Jesus so in other words, we have the Holy Spirit that's our line of communication to the Father. That's why we don't have to go to priests. That's why the curtain was torn. That's why we don't have to do sacrifice, uh, sacrifices to be forgiven. We can go right to, the God, to God our Father and ask for forgiveness. We can go right to him and ask for his help. Amen. We can go right to him and ask for his help. Amen. Let's give him praise. Thank you, God. I don't have to go through a bunch of rituals for God to hear me. He already knows. He's waiting for me to ask something in his name to help me. I'm more confident when I go make disciples because I know the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is working on my behalf to help me. It's if I would be willing. He says, if you believe, you would do greater works. If you believe today that God can use you to make disciples, to change this world, he will show up in your life. We need to understand the context once again in this scripture. Jesus wasn't talking to Christians who were going to live for themselves. He was encouraging his disciples who were going to give their lives to make disciples. He knew that Peter would be turned upside down and crucified. He knew that others would be beheaded for the gospel. He knew. And they were going to need courage and boldness and help. Listen, this is the Holy Spirit. You don't need the Holy Spirit to show up to church, do you? To church, do you? We don't need the Holy Spirit to, to order Chick-fil-A. I don't know why it's on my mind. I wish it wasn't closed on Sundays. <laughs> We, they're closed, right? <laughs> Good. It's about time someone honors their employees and lets them go to church. I'll probably get an email about that one. Um, <sighs> yeah. Wow. We don't need the Holy Spirit to watch Netflix. We need the Holy Spirit to make disciples. Now, here's the thing. I could use the Holy Spirit to go golf, to play golf, because I bring someone with me that needs Jesus. So God is in this, God is in this ministry of redeeming the things of this world. If I am meeting someone at Chick-fil-A, Lord, thank you. They have good food. 
and I'm meeting someone there. I need the Holy Spirit to help me resist every large fry and help him follow Jesus. Right? I mean, we, we need the Holy Spirit to help us make disciples. And so what I'm saying is, is let use the things, use this life. Inviting and knowing that the Holy Spirit is with us. I think, Dan, can I use you as an example? Dan's a coach, a football coach. He uses sports to minister to young men. It's, for him, it's not a game. For him, it's, it's discipleship. And so we use football games. And, and, and you know, if we're going to have a Super Bowl party, let's invite the lost over and show them how to have fun without all the other stuff. You know, let's do things like that. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to work in our everyday lives. We need the Holy Spirit to be the church, to be the church that will push back the darkness and take back what the enemy has stolen. We need the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew that his disciples would need the Holy Spirit to push back the darkness and steal or take back what the enemy has stolen. Because a lot of the work that we're going to do is spiritual. It's, it's insight that we don't have. We're only human. But God knows about someone's situation. God is priming people for you to meet this week. God is priming that believer that is struggling to grow for you to hang out with this week. He is helping them right now. He is, he is give, he's putting them through situations where they're gonna need to cry out for help and you're gonna be the one. And because you're operating in the spirit and you're studying the word of God and you're praying, you're gonna know what to do and say. I promise you that's how it works in my life and that's how it works in your life. That's how God works. Next, we are empowered by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I can't take a ton of time on this. As I say every week, it needs its own series. But Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. These are like offices of leadership, so to say. But anyone in this room can be gifted in those areas. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So one of my tasks as a pastor and my prophetic gifting that I have is to build you up to do the work alongside me. And it's just not just me, it's all of us. Because we all have been called to make disciples. He says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son, that we will be mature in the Lord. So that grow value is in there, measuring up to the full complete standard of Christ. I love 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. The end of the world is coming soon, Peter was saying. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers, which means forgive, a multitude of sins. For love forgives a multitude of sins. Peter was referring to the Hebrew word cover from Proverbs 10, 12, which means to forgive or bury or hide. In other words, you don't bring up that sin again. You put it away. It's gone. It's been casted out to the sea. You forgive and you hide it away. We love each other that much. Cheerfully share your home with those in need of a meal or a place to stay. God has given us each, or God has given each of you a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts. There's a lot of gifts, and I gave you scriptures to go further study. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ and all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. God has given us gifts to do the work of the ministry and to build each other up so that we'll be more effective and be a light in our mission fields. And then lastly, we're empowered, and this goes along with this, we are empowered by the unity of the spirit-filled gifted church. I was reading through Ephesians 4 this week, and it really came, it really hit me There's power in the body of Christ being on the same page. Why? Well, when we're all growing, we're all helping each other grow. When we're all using our spiritual gifts that you can read this week, and, and we'll have to do a series on that, you need to, we really need to know how equipped we really are. It's, it's, a, it's beautiful. 
Just the gift of encouragement is a spiritual gift. I mean, when we're encouraging each other, wow. Ephesians 4, 16 says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Let me read that again, Ephesians 4, 16. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. It's evident in Ephesians 4 that there is power in the church that's unified and on one page and growing together and using their gifts. Because here's the reality, and this is, and this is why on Sunday mornings we can't co- completely operate in all of our gifts because we're in a large setting. And this is why I believe in community groups so much. Because when you break down in smaller groups, everyone can start using their giftings more. And this is, this is I wasn't trying to push groups today, but this is important. This is why we need to live in smaller community as a large church. Because some of you are so gifted in this room. God has anointed you and gifted you with gifts. And it's hard to do that if I'm speaking this entire time, right? Well, it's because we're supposed to live in community all week and encourage and speak and to prophesy and to teach and to pastor and to do all these other gifts, heal, all those things, to have faith. When you read the list, you'll see. There's so many gifts and it's, it's to be a dispenser of God's grace to each other. All of you are. You're empowered to do that, not just with the lost, but for the body of Christ. You see it mostly in scripture to help build up the body of Christ so that when we come in here and we go to our groups and we're inviting the lost to those groups or we're going out to the lost, we are, we are stronger. We're stronger. If we say we can't do this, we are saying God can't. Isn't that interesting? If I say I can't do this, in a way we're saying that God can't do it because God wants to do it and he plans to do it. I would like to change that to this. I can't do this, but God can through me. Therefore, I can. I can do it. God through me. And lastly, God calls us to make disciples with the promise that his power will be with us. This is a promise. Jesus said it multiple times in the verses we read. We may not have caught it, but this was a promise that God would equip us and empower us to make disciples. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and we're just gonna prepare ourselves to receive the power. And today, If you're in this room and you you just really just need the help of God, I want to invite you up to this altar right now. If you just need the help and power of God, I want to invite you up here. If you're being called to make disciples, you, you know you're ready. We've all been called. But you feel a tug that you're going to use your life to make disciples. I want to invite you up to be filled and to be equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even if you don't feel ready, I want to encourage you to to ask God to help you today. We're going to sing a song that says, Build My Life. And I want to encourage you as well to come and pray for people as well. To surround each other as the body of Christ and pray. We're going to sing a song that says, build my life. And Jesus is building your life on him. He's building your life on him. But sometimes there's things that get in the way. Jesus... He builds and uses us He's gracious, but something, sometimes he needs to remove some things in our lives that he doesn't want to build on. Hindrances that he doesn't want to build on. Sometimes he'll come in and he'll clean away the dirt before he puts another brick on, you know? 
so that it would be strong and sure that that house would be built strong. So if there's anything in your life today that we need to confess and get off of our shoulders, I would encourage you to do that as well. To tell God, God, I'm sorry, I need to get rid of this. I want to be filled up today and empowered and equipped. Anyone else today would join us up here, please, please do. As we worship, let's not hurry this moment and let's just hang out with God and let him work the way he wants to work.